Prints from Serenissima, connoisseurship and graphic art in 18th century Venice. An exhibition catalogue written for the Pope. He has published Napoleon's Sorcerer's The Sophisian University of Delaware Press, 2007, which explores the Masonic context for the revived Isis cult in Napoleon, France. Spike received a bachelor from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, a master and PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and an MBA in finance of the International University of Japan. He was a Mellon visiting professor at the California Institute of Technology in 2011, prior to joining LSU. In 2003, Spike served as Philip and Lynn's Rose Curatorial Fellow at the Fort Art Museum at Harvard University and worked for a commercial gallery dealing in Russian art vanguard art domiciled in Cologne, Germany, and Berg, uh, Switzerland. So, very sweet. I wanted to thank you for inviting me to this fabulous exhibition and this uh, great symposium. So, uh, you know, when uh, this, these events were first brought to my attention and I, I revisited the whole issue of Cartier and antiquity, one thing that really struck me uh, was the whole issue of Pyrenees. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think this is a subtext that came up on several occasions um, that, uh, you know, Pyrenees is. Uh, uh, prints in particular uh, provided a source of inspiration potentially and I wanted to kind of go into greater depth here a little bit and uh, look into both the writings and uh, but most particularly the visual evidence and uh, also what this means in a, uh, in a broader sense uh, about the uh, kind of impact that Percier had uh, on the 19th century. So uh, we've talked a couple of times already about the Col Gratuite de Saint um, where he started out. And um, these are some illustrations from the Illustration. Some of you may recognize that. And that means, of course, they are much later than uh, Percier's days uh, back at that institution. And you see that the students are very eager copying plaster casts here, which was not the case in Percier's days. They were actually handed um, very frequently um, uh, prints that were protected with Collapse. And they were asked to reproduce those prints as precisely as possible, basically. And that made you a good student. So it was a menial task, uh, all things considered, given that uh, these uh, students were supposed to go on and uh, uh, kind of work in, in the larger field of les arts industriels. Uh, which is, of course, uh, different from the uh, intellectual claim of uh, uh, high arts. Um, uh, and I, I think, you know, in, in the literature, the case has often been made about the different social origins of, of Percier and Fontaine, which already plays out in their educational um, background. And uh, so definitely this was a, a large institution, you know, this morning. Uh, we talked about that as well, some 1,500 students who attended there at any time, uh, mostly in their teens, mostly from social kind of lower, you know, or, or, uh, these are generalizations, of course, but uh, not necessarily, you know, the same level of people you would perhaps have in the academia, right? And, and so, again, the cornerstone here was copying from prints, and I think that is very important. And the, these early experiences of copying from prints uh, is, is something that, uh, in my opinion, defined very much uh, the later mm -hmm. practice uh, by Percier, right? Uh, and so, uh, anyhow, the, the, but, but you do have the building here, which gives us a nice sense. So, um, another thing that tipped me off was, uh, was reading uh, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, plus célèbre maison de plaisance de Rome et des six environs. Um, and right at the beginning of the, this publication, actually, there is an overt reference to Piranesi. 
and it kind of highlights the kind of conflicted um, attitude towards uh, Piranesi. Uh, uh, Chassier implicitly compared himself to Piranesi here, um, but he says, I'm better than him. Uh, right? uh, I'm doing villas, he's only doing gardens, and of course, if you know Piranesi, he's done a lot more than just gardens, but in any case, that's, that's what he claims. Uh, right? And uh, he also makes the point that rightly or wrongly, that uh, Piranesi really focused on the picturesque part, la partie pittoresque of Rome, whereas uh, he himself uh, was, and, and also that he was copyist, right, and uh, made the only imitation exact, um, so it's not really innovative or original, and of course the whole point of this is that he is doing all of those things that Piranesi was not doing. Um, and um, so I think, um, uh, obviously, he is, he's, he's criticizing, or he intends to criticize Piranesi here. But the very fact that he's mentioning Piranesi at the beginning in these terms shows us, I think, that he was work, thinking very hard about Piranesi. Uh, and uh, you know, and definitely was very much familiar with that. So again, I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with Piranesi, who he was, why he's important, and so on. But permit me, level, nevertheless, to show you uh, a few uh, selected works uh, by Piranesi. Right, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, the prima parte di architettura perspectiva. So Piranesi's work, of course, dates mostly from the second half of the 18th century. Um, there are two types of works, all of them prints, needless to say. Um, one is a, a very precise rendering of rooms to be found uh, mostly in Rome and its environs. Uh, and the second one, of course, deals with the more fantastic part of these prints. Um, he was himself, he may have been trained as an architect, he was not a painter, certainly one of the great printmakers of the 18th century, right? Uh, he is also somebody who never hesitates for one second to, to uh, mix styles, of course. Rome uh, figures very prominently here, but also early Christian materials, Renaissance, Baroque period, and so on and so on. So uh, in any case, this is an early volume that was realized uh, in Rome. Um, perhaps what is also important to mention here is uh, the client base. Uh, uh, very frequently uh, people were going on the grand tour, right, and would bring back these volumes, of course, many, time, uh, many times people from Great Britain, but also Americans, you know, I worked at the Falk Art Museum in the print cabinet, they have the wonderful volumes uh, of Piranesi. They were actually brought back by uh, an early uh, uh, Harvard alumnus who went on the grand tour. Uh, so in any case, this is kind of typical, and of course, Piranesi's uh, renderings were all over the place. They were ubiquitous uh, at the uh, time when uh, uh, um, our, our artist kind of reached his prime. And, and so, so therefore, you know, I think it, it is fair to say that he may have already come across uh, these uh, renderings uh, while he was attending uh, the, his, uh, the, the earliest art school. Um, so in any case, this is Hadrian's monument, right? Um, and uh, so uh, here's uh, the Colosseum uh, by Piranesi, and you see that he's going to great length here uh, to render uh, every little detail uh, of the Colosseum the way it looked uh, back in those days. Uh, but at the same time, he's compiling these uh, over-the-top architectural fantasies um, of uh, uh, monuments that are jumbled together, capriccios, of course, caprices. Um, and, and here's a frontispiece for uh, uh, L'Antiquità Romana uh, from 1756. Um, uh, and uh, here's again uh, the, the rusticated ma masonry uh, from Hadrian's Mausoleum, uh, certainly something that he copied directly uh, there. Uh, but then there's a famous prison series, um, you know, uh, these are, of course, invented prisons, um, and uh, they stand out as some of the great artworks of fantastic art. Um, but back to Parsier and, and his kind of uh, development and uh, his entourage, right? Uh, I, I wanted to show you some examples by um, friends of his um, and, and also later on his, uh, um, his teachers and uh, uh, in all instances, I think we can see certain par parallels with, with Piranesi. Uh, so these, these are works by uh, Louis-Pierre Baltard and uh, Charles-Pierre-Joseph Normand. Uh, 
Um, and Baltar was, was somebody who was also very much intrigued in the kind of picturesque aspects of, of Rome, and uh, you can see perhaps uh, certain parallels. Um, this is this, this, to say, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a scene here in, in Paris, but it looks like the Pantheon in Rome. Um, and so, um, you know, obviously this, uh, these uh, Roman antiquities are on their minds. Uh, Normand, in particular, gets into publishing books uh, on architecture uh, for training and educational purposes. And this is, of course, was very close uh, to uh, Persier's heart as well. Uh, so these are kind of prototypes for buildings, you know, custom houses. This is a prototype for custom houses that are randomly selected. And there are a great many similar drawings uh, or uh, reproductions of drawings in, of course, publications by Persier. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, mixed in with capriccios that look uh, surprisingly uh, like uh, Pyrene uh, like Pyrenees, and so uh, you know the, that's that's keep this in mind. Um, uh, at the French Academy in Rome, uh, he uh, was a student of Julien David Le Roy, uh, who actually uh, published these uh, uh, ruins, the greatest monuments of Greece, and uh, this is the Parthenon. Now, if you didn't know that it is uh, by Le Roi, you may easily mistake it for Piranesi uh, print, I think, and, and that's very justifiable given the style and the type of rendering that we're dealing with here. So, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, even one of his teachers uh, was profoundly influenced here, um, and uh, so there, there we go, right? And, and so it continues, this influence continues then also during the Roman days. In case I haven't convinced you, here's a Piranesi, um, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm showing you, you know, uh, uh, compare uh, to uh, Le Roi. Uh, in any case, I think one can, one can see the similarity, and I think it's a fair assessment, that uh, Le Roi was, was influenced also by Piranesi. Um, I'm, I'm, I scanned this title page uh, from LSU's um, a copy of the uh, Palais Maison et Autres Edifices Modernes in Rome, uh, because I think it, it allows me to make a point that uh, I think made it easy, may have gotten easily overlooked, and that is uh, the, uh, the importance of Percy outside of France. As you can see, there's a label <coughs> that was attached uh, for uh, the, the New York publisher, right? Um, and so um, these uh, publications uh, were continued to be reprinted throughout the 19th century. And they had a huge subsequent impact for that reason, and also great impact on uh, American uh, interior designers. They were, after all, uh, intended uh, on, on some level uh, also as didactic material uh, to uh, encourage uh, aspiring um, architects, interior designers, to kind of follow the footsteps of Cartier and um, be acquainted with these, these great monuments in Rome, so they have a practical purpose here, right? <clears throat> so in any case, uh, on, on the right are some of the, uh, you know, reliefs and urns, and uh, this is, uh, again, this uh, was mentioned earlier, but this is broken down into several chapters, and uh, each chapter then uh, contains these kind of prototypical Beaux-Arts architectural drawings, you know, and. Uh, of course, in this case, the palaces of Rome, the Panesa Palace we looked at earlier, and, you know, but basically as models, as, as aesthetic models to be copied, and the uh, drawings are very clear cut with like these. Um, but they are always introduced by these frontispieces, and, and this is actually a watercolor that served, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as a composition that was then uh, actually engraved for the actual volume, so it has all of the nice color and preserves the kind of nice uh, draftsmanship that we see here, and so I brought it in um, for that purpose. So this is actually introducing chapter 12. So uh, you, you open up with, with this flight of fancy, and then it, once you get uh, into the actual monuments, it gets a little bit more dry cut, you know, and, and so on. But in any case, um, uh, I, I think this is a great example for how uh, Piranesi uh, remained uh, an important aspect uh, of uh, Persier's uh, creative creativity um, and uh, architectural practice, you could say. 
Um, these are kind of jumbles, urns, busts, uh, reliefs of various sorts. Uh, this is actually upstairs. Now, I didn't know that it was here. And, uh, you know, I, one of the amazing things that I found about Persier and his drawings is uh, that there is a, a huge number of these drawings floating around in the art market, and they come up at auction once in a while. And I'm pretty sure that most of them are, of course, uh, deprived of their original context. <coughs> but um, it's very sizable, and uh, certainly there are still a lot of surprises based on what, what may appear at auction of one at one time or another. So in any case, I select this because it kind of uh, came up at auction, and I was very, very surprised, positively surprised, to actually see it upstairs mentioned private collection. So in any case, that's a true treat. But here again, I'm, I'm interested in this frontispiece to chapter 12 on a more conceptual level. Um, because again, it is this this jumble, this uh, you know, of, of course, a flight of fancy, uh, of architectural fancy that he is creating here, uh, and opening each one of these sixteen cahiers uh, with these uh, with these uh, like uh, uh, accumulations of classical antiquities, and then you get into the more technical aspects of the plants, the elevations, the section drawings. That's, of course, where the didactic nature comes in. But you start out with the antiquarian fantasy that uh, is, in my opinion, ultimately inspired by Piranesi. Right, so here, here's what I mean, right? This is another page that shows you the plan, uh, cross-section, all of that. But, uh, you know, again, you always open it with, uh, with compositions of that nature. Here's, again, uh, a typical example of Piranesi. Um, kind of getting into uh, reliefs uh, and sarcophagi of various sorts and, and putting these objects together so as to create new and surprising assemblages of one sort or another. Bases, of course, are also very important uh, in this game. So this is uh, from 1778. And uh, here is, again, um, an, an architectural capriccio by, by Percier or two, actually, by Percier. Um, I'm interested in the one on the left mainly because of the perspective, which is another key feature, I think, where uh, Piranesi's and Percier's work come together. Uh, very frequently, this kind of uh, uh, deeply receding um, avenues, uh, uh, walkways of one sort or another, lined uh, with uh, antiquities of various sorts. So um, in any case, the, the selection of objects is, is certainly similar to Piranesi. Uh, here's Piranesi's plan of Rome uh, made out of fragments. So the very idea of having fragments and, and fragmented objects uh, uh, from antiquity, I think, is key. And of course, fragments uh, have their own aesthetic appeal in their incompleteness, and I think both artists play on, on this specific aesthetic appeal of incompleteness. Um, uh, so in any case, I wanted to get back uh, off, uh, to the uh, aspect of the, these deep recesses of roads leading into the distance. Um, now, one can find many examples for Piranesi, and I think I may have one. But I wanted to point out that, of course, Piranesi's influence uh, was uh, very uh, widespread in France. This is the frontispiece of the Napoleonic description of Egypt. And uh, we, we look at the Medaillé, or you have seen the Medaillé, which is, of course, you know, part of this whole trend of Egyptomania. And Vivant de Nantes played a very important role, but then a little bit after Vivant de Nantes' description of the uh, Egyptian campaign, uh, the official Napoleonic description came out that dragged on endlessly into the early 19th century. Um, but uh, here, here is the frontispiece again. Um, <clears throat> Also, publication in multiple volumes, huge volumes, if you have ever seen that monumental. Uh, but uh, these volumes also contain a lot of uh, dry cut uh, kind of uh, elevations and plans of monuments. But, but here again, for the frontispiece, it's okay to have this architecture fly the fancy and you see the road receding in the background lined with Egyptian antiquities of any kind at this point in time. So, so this is something that is kind of happening a little bit all over the place in France. Uh, these, uh, these are actually, I believe the one on the left is, is actually present upstairs. 
um, uh, these are designs uh, for opera uh, written by uh, Gurin Tree, uh, who was very, very popular at this time. Uh, uh, and, and his, his operas also had a kind of popular appeal, I think one needs to add, right? But uh, this is supposed to take place in Madagascar, of course, so it's an exotic <laughs> setting. And, and yet you find the same formula being used <coughs> of this road that's kind of receding into the background and is lined by buildings. And then you have this, uh, in, in the example on, on the left here, um, this kind of barrel vaulted entry, which is also kind of interesting because there are similar uh, Piranesi compositions that uh, contain um, these uh, the wooden centerings for barrel walls. Can Canaletto, incidentally, painted uh, about the same time, a painting of Westminster Bridge being constructed with this, this wooden centering. So in any case, I, I found that interesting as a, as a comparison here. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of the uh, receding road or the kind of uh, the receding walls uh, creating a sense of uh, uh, infinite depth, basically. Of course, it's also a trick, right? A visual trick to, to convince you that there is an, an infinite wealth of these stock uh, monuments and, and, and antiquities. It, it never stops, right? It's a wellspring of, of materials of this sort. And that's, uh, you know, that's what is, in my opinion, implied here. And again, it works for Madagascar as well as for Egypt, as well as for Rome. Um, but it is just on some level Piranesi who starts it. Mm. Uh, my, my, my last remarks here are, are concerned with that other uh, very, very uh, famous uh, publication uh, by uh, Percy and Fontaine, the Recueil de Decoration Intérieure uh, from uh, the early 19th century, from the Napoleonic period. Um, here are some spreads, uh, some of them uh, are hand colored, others not, and of course, needless to say, the impression uh, is, is always very different whether you have hand coloring or you just have the line drawing down below. Um, so in any case, we've talked about these things before, but I wanted to draw the attention uh, or draw your attention to the fact that even in these interior designs, we have certain elements that are reminiscent of Piranesi. If you look at, for instance, um, the, these wall panels that you see here, there's the same element of accumulation of objects uh, with uh, clearly classical overtones, um, Hermes figures, altars, vases, sculptures, uh, desks, so it branches out into furniture for sure, but uh, nevertheless the, the principle remains the same. And, and again, you know, I went into the stacks and kind of pulled out, you know, randomly the copies uh, at, at LSU's library, and I was kind of amazed by the binding, um, and uh, here's a kind of Art Nouveau uh, binding, uh, obviously uh, put on the cover by the distributor um, of uh, this volume uh, back when it was sold, uh, and of course there couldn't be a bigger kind of break or inconsistency between the uh, cover label and what's inside. But these volumes are all well worked and they were owned by most of the people. You see an inscription in the Université in Paris and then in New York and so they traveled widely and I think that is, uh, there's an important lesson to be learned in the material consistency of these books because they show us how widely they circulated and how late in the 19th and early 20th century they were still being used, reprinted, and so on. So, uh, you know, we're talking about the Empire style, and Napoleon is gone, and perhaps there's a little bit of an afterlife, but the truth of the matter is they were still used and, and very popular, and they were used for their intended purpose. This is a spread again from the same volume here at LSU, and you see, I, I have no idea who made this drawing, so some random art student or owner uh, who added this and felt inspired by it. So I think it's a very interesting kind of evidence for how um, artists, designers who own these things would actually use them, right? <clears throat> so there is this didactic purpose. And this brings me perhaps to the last point here uh, about uh, these, uh, these volumes, and, and that is the similarity 
um, of certain aspects of Persini's work with the pattern books that became very, very popular in the late 19th and early 20th century. And uh, I could have uh, uh, kind of brought in probably hundreds of examples of, of uh, pattern books. I'm just contending myself here with Owen Jones's um, uh, Pompeian wall decorations. And this is, again, uh, an undated drawing, pen and ink uh, drawing by Percy uh, with an accumulation of antiquities. Now, here again, it is interesting to kind of retrace this evolution. Uh, you know, we start out with Piranesi, <clears throat> and uh, he inspires, of course, not just Persier, but a whole generation um, of uh, architects, designers, uh, uh, interior designers, and, and so on. And, and so we see, still see these, these elements of the Piranesi-like accumulation. But the same ideas also underline the pattern books. The pattern books were marketed again with the intention of inspiring artists, designers, and architects um, to copy these designs, to invent themselves, to help professional practice. In reality, however, they turned out to be a product uh, of their own. Uh, people, uh, consumers, uh, bought these, these books for their own inherent beauty. And uh, this is not to dismiss the fact that they may have been used for uh, fostering uh, aesthetic practice, for uh, encouraging students uh, to copy this, um, but uh, the initial purpose uh, kind of fell into oblivion. And again, this became a, a huge passion fad um, of it, and until, I would say, the middle of the 20th century. By, by the 1930s, it was kind of over. Um, but you had all kinds of uh, pattern books, of course, lots of them with classical antiquity, uh, but also you would have later on you know, more modern designs, you know, uh, let's say Art Deco-like designs, uh, or Renaissance designs, Chinese designs, uh, designs from non-European countries, uh, depending on the flavor. Right. So this is a very important development uh, in the uh, applied arts here, uh, starting by the <coughs> second half, middle of the 19th century, and into the uh, middle of, of the 20th century. Um, here's some more. There's another um, juxtaposition between uh, Percier and, and Owen Jones. Right. So these are, of course, reliefs, vases, busts, and so on and your similar uh, Roman reliefs here in the grammar of ornament, which was one of the most popular pattern books of the 19th century. And I think, uh, uh, I think we, we do gather the fact that these are two separate artists who did this, but in terms of their style, in terms of their approach, I, I think there's a lot of similarity. So, uh, and I think one can uh, really talk about these publications by Percy as also precursors of the later fashion fad for, for pattern books. Right? And I think this was my last slide. Thank you very much.